The Secret Keeper opens in 1961 on a hot, sweltering summer's day with a teenage girl called Laurel who's sitting up the top of her childhood treehouse while her family celebrates a birthday party on the stream that runs alongside their farm. And Laurel's dreaming about a boy called Billy and a move she wants to make to London and a future she just can't wait to seize. But before the idyllic summer's day is out, Laurel will have witnessed a crime that changes everything. Now, the book picks up in 2011 when Laurel is a well-known actress who's overcome with shades of the past, haunted by memories and the mystery of this event that she just can't explain. She returns to the family house and starts to piece together a secret history. It's a tale of three strangers, Jimmy, Dorothy and Vivian, who are brought together in wartime London and whose lives become fiercely and fatefully entwined. One of the first ideas I had for The Secret Keeper was this very strong image of a girl sitting in a tree dreaming about the future. And you know, it was very warm and sunny and there was that sort of summer's breeze coming through the, the window opening in the tree house. And that's definitely um, comes from my own life. Uh, I grew up on Tambourine Mountain, which um, is a rural uh, mountainous area in southeast Queensland and I spent a lot of time climbing trees with books so that I could hide there away from parents who wanted me to do far more important things like chores and, and disappear inside the world of my stories. I am quite obsessed with the idea that the past and the present are tethered together and I think there were a lot of things in my childhood that have led me to that, that obsession. Um, for instance, when I was growing up my mum was an antiques dealer and she really taught me that you know within each object there are a lot of different stories you know the different hands through which that object has passed. So we spent a lot of time being dragged into secondhand shops which at the time seemed like very scary dark um, Aladdin's cave type places full of mysterious objects and, and grimy, dusty things, but which always guaranteed had a spot at the back where all the old books had been thrown haphazardly onto shelves, which is where, of course, I would you know, make a beeline for that area and see which newest Enid Blyton had been you know, thrown onto the shelf with a five cent price tag on it. I knew I wanted to set the historical part of the story in World War II London and I had a lot of books but I really wanted more than that because I love um, to inject as much verisimilitude as I can into my books. So when I was in London in 2008 I found a walking tour and I'm so grateful that I did because the way I saw London completely changed. It's one of my favourite cities but all of a sudden my guide Clive was able to walk me through London and show me that the Blitz is still there if you know where to look for it. Every part of the writing process has its rewards and its challenges. Uh, for instance, the beginning drafting segment is, is one of my favourites because it's completely without barriers, you know, and, and the project itself is 100% potential because you haven't started to try and lock um, abstract ideas into concrete form, you know, on the page. I spend months um, really just reading everything I can get my hands on, um, looking at pictures, watching films, listening to music, anything that feeds the, the great cauldron um, within my mind. And I take copious notes. Um, by the end of each book, I would have you know, upward of 10 notebooks absolutely filled with scribbled and scrawled ideas and questions to myself and things I have to look into. I, I sometimes see parts of the book unfolding in my mind as if they're films that have, or, or things that have really happened to real people. And when that's happening, I am the filter. I, I like to sit you know, in a coffee shop, for instance, and just scribble and scribble and scribble as fast as I can so that everything I see in my mind is put onto those pages. But when it comes time to actually write and put the words on the page, one after the other, hopefully in almost the right order. I like the discipline of sitting at my desk and, and typing. And when I'm typing on a computer, I'm not seeing the black marks that appear on my screen. I really am seeing the story unfold as I do that. But having said that, there's something I love about the final stages, the editing, because it's the last polish that you get to give the project. And for somebody who loves words, and 
likes to spend time deciding which is the best out of five different synonyms to describe a particular feeling or, or vision or sound or smell, there's a real um, reward in that part of the storytelling. I don't think writers choose their genre. I think the genre chooses the writer. And certainly for me, with the type of books I write that are uh, multi-layered with um, characters and times and places all woven together to form quite a complex tapestry, that for me is a very natural way to tell a story. Not easy, certainly not that, but it is natural. I don't know that I'd be able to tell any other sort. And certainly, while I write for readers, I also write for myself and I need the world of the story to feel complete and complex so that when I'm inside it, it's multidimensional and I can disappear within its world. And if I don't include all those layers, the book is just too thin and I get no pleasure from it. <laughs> the Secret Keeper in One Line. Uh, it shifts between the 1930s, the 1960s and the present day. And it's a story of mysteries and secrets, of theatre and thievery, of murder and enduring love.